Thank you. And I'm really thankful for the opportunity to speak and honored that anyone thought of me to, um, to do this. So um, I, I think I'll just get right into it. And here's a picture from the top of Hogsback Bluff of our farm in around 2012. And here's where we started out. So uh, five generations ago, it was a very diversified farm. You can see uh, up in the front here, just a few apple trees. And it's an undated photo, but I know that my dad mentioned that this was his crate hanging tree, that as he was making crates, he would hang them. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure how he quite made them, but I just feel like we are a fifth generation farm and we're the first generation that's been able to not have to have jobs outside of the farm. So I feel like that is truly a blessing. I feel like we just have to keep the wheels on the bus. We don't have to build the bus. So to all the first generation farmers out there, I really respect you and, and all that you face. Um, we're, we're able to just try to keep it going, make decisions based on that. Um, I've decided to introduce our whole team, both past and present. And this is my dad, Peter Ecker. He is truly the reason that we are here. We get to live out his dream on the farm. He had a lot of one-liners that have helped me um, over the last 13 years while I've been managing. But he, one of his famous lines that he borrowed was, the cure for boredom is curiosity. And he was truly the inventor. This is his packing line. And he really believed what you can't afford, you have to invent. So it took him, I would say 20 years, and he did make about 20 or 30 of these machines for other growers. So he really believed that, you know, you have to be able to grow, sell, and market your own product as much as you can. The second it leaves your hand, you lose control over the price. So um, he had this set up, he really wanted it to be safe and quiet for kids. So it's a feature in our retail space as well. So an inventor, an artist, he believed uh, the eye needs a place to rest. So everything on the farm had a place and he always parked his equipment straight. Uh, he was the ideas man and a great grower and a community builder. There he is um, on the train that he built at the Catfish Days uh, event. So he's very proud of it. He bled green uh, from Packers to John Deere. This is my grandma, Janet. and. She was, a, she was a character, um, a perfectionist in every way, a foodie way ahead of her time, very much a rural socialite. Um, homemakers was her claim to fame. She was the Carmel Queen. She got us going on our Carmel product, and she was an antiquer. Um, everything, that, everything that grandma did, if it was perfect, that was the goal. So if she made one pie a year and it was perfect, then her, her job was done and she was accomplished. So uh, one thing that was a little bit challenging with Graham is just really no concept of the financials. So she was a bit of a spender and in some tough times on the farm that made things a little bit stressful and challenging. So a wonderful lady, but um, it wasn't always easy. So in her lines, things will look better in the morning and nobody got hurt, no matter what the disaster. Well, no one got hurt. Here's my mother, Mary, and she is our baker, our bookkeeper, head of all mowing operations. If you're going to get on a mower, you better ask first. She's the chief financial officer, and we lovingly refer to her as money bags. So her uh, quotes if you ask to make a farm improvement project, she is going to say no. And then six months later, okay, but it's not gonna work. And then two years later, she's wondering how we ever lived on the farm with it any other way. But I think as the bookkeeper, she saw us through a lot of hard times and is still paying down on, you know, every loan we've ever taken out. So to have someone with the checkbook that is initially going to say no is not a bad thing. And she, being the baker, this is when someone did not change the setting on the giant mixer we have 
when she went in and started up the pies that day. So once in a while, we get her a little bit. Here is Jessica. This is my sister and I could not have asked for a better sister and partner and friend. Um, she is a very special person. I think she got a lot of dad. So she is PR and HR does all of our hiring for um, our sales and retail. All events, she is a born wedding planner, concert planner. She's just always, she's a continuous thinker. She's always thinking, great architect. I said that she is a red tape waiter because she is in charge of um, procuring the licensures to do our beer garden and making our cider. She really builds relationships in the community so that you know, you're know, you gonna need that person on zoning sometime. You're, you're going to need someone from the food and, food and drug and the FTA that is on your side. Um, she is, has an intuitive BS meter. She calls it like she sees it from, um, she's always polite to customers, but she will call, she will call their bluff for sure. Here's Simon, Jessica's husband. He is, um, I always say I waited 30 years for a brother and I just could not have picked out a better one. He is a fantastic addition to the team, very kind uh, mechanic, a contractor, comic relief. And when you have that inspection from, you know, your state inspection or when the insurance comes out to appraise the crop to lay on some thick Australian charm never hurts. And he has a line, we don't complain about how someone does their job because then you might have to do it yourself. So that has kind of been the strategy for the last 13 years. Um, yeah, you know, you can give your, you can give your opinion and you can give your advice, but I would, Obviously, honestly, if it's not in your department, just keep that in mind. So the picture down here on the right, dad had a saying, last in the cooler, first with the chainsaw. And I think that he is um, chopping down some brush on a, on a brush line and not actually trees because they look quite large there. But that was nice to keep in mind. You know, don't, don't hold on to stuff if it's not making you any money. And here is me. Um, when I did transition and uh, take over for my dad, a neighboring farm came over and helped us run our tractor for the first time. And we were all lined up, me, Jess, and my mom, and no one else hopped in the tractor that day. And so I became the default orchardist. I'm also the default multi peril insurance technician. And it is a lot of paperwork, but I would not grow apples without it. The weather can get you every time in so many different ways. And then I say, I'm the beginning Spanish speaker. So our picking team is largely Spanish speaking. They live in Arcadia and usually work one shift at either the local uh, furniture factory or at the chicken processing plant. So being able to just basically communicate and the people that I've worked with a long time I will say something in Spanish to them and they will translate again in Spanish to the rest of the group. So I know that my ability level is low, but thankfully it does not take a lot of communication to pick apples and, and pack them. And I would, I, I love my crew. Um, I'm actually picking up um, Michigan peaches here because ours would never look this nice. So, so for the first 25 years of my life, this was our team on the farm. And I don't know how many millions of times we said, ask dad. And so this is my um, advice to any beginning farmer or any, just anyone working in a family business. Even if you don't think you're gonna take it over, learn how to run the equipment, learn a few of the ins and outs of the business because you might be thrown in someday and we never drove tractor with our dad. So learning all of that by ourselves was, it just didn't have to be that way. Um, so after, after my dad passed away, um, my sister and my mom and I ran the farm for five years, uh, pretty much the three of us. And I learned that 
the wheels actually fall off equipment after about five years. So dad had said, and he was absolutely right, the hardest thing was going to be keeping the equipment running. Something broke every day. And I mean, not only just the, the shock of, you know, losing, losing the patriarch who knew so much information, just it was a defeating that something was broken every day. And some of our first saviors and just blessings that arrived, a guy came that was recently retired who was a maintenance man at a cheese factory and he started to be able to fix up our equipment. Um, as we added to our team, this is our current team. Simon is a mechanic and a contractor and a tool maker. So he moved right into my dad's shop. It's not the newest CNC equipment, but it works. Um, and Ren, we, this is my husband. We're lucky he actually does not work on the farm. He has his own income. So, you know, you're, we're, we're really only trying to provide for the farm itself and three people. Uh, my mom was a PE teacher for 37 years. So she has never taken a dime from the farm and she pays for all of our household expenses still so that it is hard to make it go if you're not working off farm to generate enough income to run the farm and run the families. So Ren is able to help out significantly in, in our household that we have. Um, we call it the city house a few miles away. Um, so this team has worked out quite well, a mechanic and tool maker, contractor, and someone who can come in. He's actually very mechanically inclined. So if we really need some advice or some specialty tools, Ren's usually got those up his sleeve. And finally, we are, not we, but Jess and Simon are expanding the family. So Jess is um, eight and a half to nine months pregnant with twins. And we, Liz said a little joke earlier that how nice of Simon to carry one of them for her. So, so you wanna be an apple farmer. And that is my little joke because I know that this is a very diversified um, group, the Iowa Practical Farmers. So I will not expound too much on actually growing of the apples, but that is my specialty. And dad had a little line, don't teach him everything you know the first day. So I'm just giving you a glimmer of the most important things that I've learned in my 32 of 36 years on the farm. So first, Honeycrisp saved my generation of apple growers. Definitely. I think that we would have lost most of the farms in this area without Honeycrisp because it's the first variety that people are willing to pay $2.50 a pound or $3 a pound for in the grocery store. You just couldn't make it on Red Delicious. You cannot make the farm payment on $6 per 40 pound um, Red Delicious anymore. So I, I also, I know that it saved our farm as well. I, I know now that some of the most stressful times in our lives um, were just that we, there was not a lot of money in the coffers. And um, my dad and I actually had a fairly challenging relationship um, for the first 21 years of my life. And I realize now it was the stress of not, not knowing if he could keep the farm for us. And now I know with his whole being, all he was trying to do was to save this wonderful place for us. And he did get to see it coming around. Um, it was really about 2009 that finally having a few years of Honeycrisp crop is able to start paying down on those farm payments and on some of the loans. So I, a sincere deepest thanks to the University of Minnesota for development and release of that variety. I wouldn't want to grow apples without at least some of the high density trellis system and drip irrigation. We're kind of late adopters to this system, but we're not going back. You can see in the background here, this is five acres planted in this system. Um, your goal is to grow apples and not wood. So if you're growing a massive tree, you're just not getting the light penetration to grow a nice consistent crop. So this is the way that we will go. I also want to send out um, just my sympathies to anyone who is affected in the derecho uh, 
we had flatline winds when I was in like 1998 and it knocked over thousands of trees. We were able to prop them up and save several, but then battle disease for the next decade. I would say that a straight line wind event like that would just rip these out like zippers. So we will always keep both some on trellis and then up on our hillsides. I think that's where we'll keep some freestanding trees to just try to diversify, give yourself a best shot of it when you get the a freak weather event. I heard Iowa is quite flat. Um, I wouldn't grow apples on flat land without frost fan. So these fans, they are not cheap. It's about $40,000 to put one in, but they are positioned so that the fan blade is just a little bit positive and it will draw warm air down from the atmosphere onto your crop. So in apples, 28 degrees at bloom, you'll have a full crop and 25 degrees, you'll lose everything. So in 2016, the crop that this fan saved was enough to purchase the fan that's in the back. This is a nice little picture of a um, hail netting as well that we can use. And I wouldn't grow apples without at least some hail netting. We take a 300 foot long uh, stretch of this anti hail netting. Simon rigged us up a little um, applicator, we call it, but it's really just a series of hoops that attach to a back of a tractor. We put the whole net in an apple bin on the back forks and we can roll out. Um, we can do about 15, we have 15 nets, we can do them all in one day. So once we know that the crop is set in an area, we can roll this netting out and we just secure it at the bottom with either zip ties or bungee cords. And I would not grow apples without as much multi peril insurance as we could afford. And with apples, they, I find that it is quite time consuming. And um, if you have a poor experience with an adjuster, it's best to let your agent know and try to keep getting the best of the best that can come out and help you on your farm. But in the 10 years that we've had multi payroll insurance, I bet we've claimed five times. So it's, it's very necessary. It really keeps us going. There is a saying in apples, uh, apple trees don't like wet feet. So I would not, I should not grow apples in a low spot. I do not recommend it for anyone. They die. So this is that $40,000 piece of equipment with a V10 engine that Simon had to sandbag and pump water out of. So this was after the polar vortex and we got the heat and melted all of the snow. Um, I would say 50 to 75% of the trees that are in this water right now are dead or dying. So with the perennial crop, your location is everything. Our retail is about 25% of the crop and it's 75% of the income. So I, even with the pies that we make and the cider that we make, it's still not that much crop to produce most of our income. and. Uh, this is dad's uh, train in all of its glory. It takes riders throughout the orchard, picks them up for pick your own. It's beautiful. Um, all John Deere green. He made it out of luggage racks from the airport. So it's just something classy and special that our farm has. Here's um, the back of our retail, which houses our commercial kitchen and also some very nice bathrooms, which uh, for large events, we do close to try to preserve, but it is there is something nice about having an actual bathroom at your facility, uh, especially as a wedding venue. You don't want your bride to have to use a porta potty if you can avoid it at all. This is a just a little section of the retail operation that we have, and this is an older photo this year with the COVID. We definitely bagged all of our fruit. And we will never go back to having our customers pick out every apple on their own. The bottom shelf here is what we consider our seconds. So if it has a marker bruise, it would be half price. All day long, we would walk by and people will dig for the apple that is 100% red without realizing that there's a backside to every fruit. And there are places on your own body that are not as tan. <laughs> so <laughs> we 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 will always bag now. It's just, we had so much less waste and reduced um, so much bruising from customers digging through piles. So 
75% of our fruit goes wholesale, and that is 25% of the income. And hopefully someday we'll be able to be at 100% retail. That's definitely where our money is. But this wholesale helps protect against the year where you lose two thirds of the crop to hail or drought or frost. So we, we grow more than we can sell. And we are lucky that we have a um, a packing facility in Elgin, Minnesota, that is able to pack the excess. It's just challenging to recoup your um, your investment when you have to go wholesale. So um, our apples are trucked up to Elgin, Minnesota, and in a wholesale facility. And this is a large wholesale warehouse in Washington that I had a picture of from an international tree fruit association. But you can just see the difference between our packing line and our little retail and this situation. And you just um, you just lose control of your pricing when you when you have to wholesale. You don't have to grow apples, but they're not making more land is a great quote from my dad. So that is why we diversify as much as we can. So all the apple sales are really just going to hold on to the crop. So part of our diversification is a bakery. We do scratch pies, around 7,000 pies a year. And we tried using our blueberries and some of our peaches when we had them. They just did not sell as well as the apples. So we only do apple. Here is a peeler. I call this Simon's first baby. It has hundreds, if not thousands of moving parts on it. And it takes about 5,000 apples to make 500 pies. We have a little saying on the farm, whatever is killing one member of the team is what you have to make your capital investment in. So peeling 5,000 apples, we, you cannot do that by hand. So this, this is a very important part of our operation. We have one guy besides Simon who runs it because if it makes even the slightest amount of a hiccup of a noise, you have to stop and go get the engineer. So it was found in the weeds of a neighboring orchard because they could do nothing with it. Because if you don't have a Simon, it was useless. <laughs> Here is our assembly team. So to make 500 pies a week, 10 to 12 people, three days a week. So. Um, this is after the apples are peeled. We do check them all one more time, uh, make sure any other peeling is removed. The seed casing of an apple kind of look, kind of looks and feels like a piece of plastic. So you do not want people returning your pie saying that there was plastic in it and it was really just a little part of the seed. In the background, we have our pie press. That's another thing is we make all of our um, dough from scratch, but we do have a machine to help press all those crusts. The pie freezer was a huge improvement um, a few years ago, so we can freeze about a thousand pies at a time. So we make fresh and freeze, and then my mom bakes pies every day. So we have a few in the freezer ready to go here, and this is our rack oven, and this was one thing that mom said, absolutely not. She did not want to burn a hundred pies at a time. And now she cannot live without this. What our old oven, she could do 30 pies at a time. And she was baking from midnight until 10 a.m. And now she can do two batches and have all of these pies ready to go. And this is Marie. And she's one of our 85 year old pie makers. Um, we were very concerned about her working this season and she did, she did great. Um, we're so thankful that everyone made it through the season safely. Um, but that does make you put your practices, you really put the effort in when you're trying to protect a loved one who's been on the farm for 30 years with us. Uh, I just thought it was so cute that she's seated with all her pies just waiting to make slices for customers. Caramel. So dad said, you've got to sell sugar and lace so you can grow all of the hardiest, healthiest food possible. And people will come in and pay $4 for one apple uh, and be just happy as clams. Um, we have seven high school kids, five hours each weekend day, and they can make about a thousand caramel apples in that time. And we make about 20,000 caramel apples a year. So having this 
we need we need the caramel. <laughs> we also wholesale our caramel. Um, it's a weather independent product because we're selling it to other businesses. I think my mom ships to about 30 other orchards. In the background, I'm not sure if you can see, but there's pails of caramel and there's also these one pound containers. So we ship out to other orchards to make their carameled apples to um, drizzle on top of their pies and their goodies as well. So it does just one more thing to take the pressure off the apples. If we lose the apples, we can still make the farm payment on our caramel sales. My hey, grandma, yeah. Sarah, just one question while you're talking about some wholesale stuff. Uh, back to your wholesale apples, do you manage the sales for those or uh, do they go through a wholesale, a distributor or, or a hub of some kind? So on our own farm, we, I would say we kind of wholesale to three grocery stores and we do a farm to school um, program. But when they go in the semi load up to the packing house in Elgin, we use Westcott Agri Products. They take on the marketing side of it. All right. And fantastic. I would, I mean, that's one more thing that I would only, we only send Honeycrisp because if you send any other variety, it doesn't recoup the cost for us to grow it. It's okay. a tough, very tough game for us. Other orchards, I think, do very well with it. I think we're just the, the wrong size. Um, and a little bit of the wrong tree density to make that happen for us. Mm -hmm. All right, back to the caramel. Okay, yes. Um, it So I think it's the best caramel product in the world. I may be a little bit partial. It does take effort. So if you're gonna use this product, mom has them set on timers to start gently heating um, three hours before we're gonna use them. Wedding venue. So we have a wedding venue just in the orchard. We do one a month. We don't have any, It honestly, we do one a month because the grass has to recover from the event. When people cut a rug for four hours on your front lawn, it is going to be destroyed. We just don't have any hardscaping really for that yet. We do not do weddings during apple season. So really May, June, July, and August. I would recommend a very detailed contract. Uh, if you don't, you're gonna have a fireworks display in a dry orchard made of wood. And we recommend do not give them away. It is your time, your mental stress level, your staff, your property. So it's okay to charge for them. Uh, we, we don't have any interior structure for them. So we just put up a tent and we rent the tent. We have a great company that we work with uh, a tent blew down in a storm the night before a wedding. They came out and put it back up the next day. No one was the wiser. So you can make a tent look really nice. Um, people love it. Um, my sister mentioned she does have the bride and groom take out a host liquor license and then one day event insurance as well. Hogsback Brew Farm. So this is the beer garden that's on the farm. My dad had a saying, Eckers never do anything fast. So the beer garden has been five to five plus years in the making. And a lot of the work is done just by Jess and Simon from contracting and architecture work to digging in the railroad ties to make a path. So the first, the first beer garden was really just this mobile um, compressor cooler, basically a glorified kegerator. And then we started begging for donations to help pay for the actual structure. So there's a rendition of the, she really based it, Jessica really based it on the look of a corn crib. And Simon and his dad did a lot of the finishing touches on it. She again, she just, Jessica just works with one contractor who's willing to build to perfection. Their whole setup is that what you, they get one or two kegs of every type of beer. So what you are, if you come out for a full day of, at the orchard, what you start drinking at the beginning will not be what's on tap at the end. So these letters just slide into place. They can change them throughout the day as they cash kegs and 12 different tappers. So they can keep quite a selection going. And this year with COVID, I think it was the distributors of beer so that you know, we were the highest grossing beer consumers 
in the tri-state area because it was just a completely outdoor venue. So by not having infrastructure, it really helped us in this situation. Um, and Sarah, can you tell us kind of what kind of, uh, how many people, how many, how many customers you're getting a day and, and how, what hours you're open for that? So the beer garden, we just do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, usually Friday evening, four to eight, Saturday and Sunday, noon till six. I don't have an exact number for customers. I will say that it is enough revenue to start taking more pressure off the farm. Um, before Jess and Simon were pregnant with twins, they thought maybe they could give up one salary. That is because right now uh, my sister and Simon and, and I are taking a salary from the orchard. Um, so that business structure was to just try to generate more income, less stress from the farm. So it is, it's working. I know um, further ahead, the Hoot Nanny, they go through about 60 kegs of beer. So it's generating some income. As far as exactly how many customers, I don't know. I do know that people stay longer than they ever did before. So parking has become much more of an issue since we have the beer garden. We've doubled the size of the parking lot and then now we're parking them out in an open field. So. And just one more question before you get rolling with yeah. the spider. Um, who, who coordinates all your employees or is that divided up by between your, your mom and you and your sister? Yes, so I do the hiring and management of the pickers and packers my sister does all the hiring of the retail staff and my mom does the hiring and management of the pie crew. Very good. Okay, so the hard cider is one thing that we are investing in as we go along. Um, so it's our apples. There is a lot of infrastructure available offsite to press apples for much cheaper than we can afford to do. And this is one thing that we are just avoiding is the amount of, I mean, you basically need a clean room and the presses are getting better. I've now seen one that does interest me, but for, you know, 40 cents a gallon to press your cider off site, why wouldn't you? So we utilize, we've utilized um, places in Gaze Mills, Wisconsin. And this year we used our packing house. So they held on to all of our juice fruit and pressed it for us. They did charge more, but the fruit was already there. So once it's pressed, it goes into IBC totes and is frozen until it's ready to be made into cider and bottled or kegged. And we do not, even after more than five years making hard cider, we do not have any stainless steel tanks. We don't have a bottling line and we don't have our own press. We press once a year for the community. And I mean, that is not gonna get you 800 gallons or a thousand gallons. So just investing as we can afford to this year, very exciting. Um, a young man from the area who was looking into doing some orchard management uh, from with a winery background has, has come and joined the staff. Thank goodness. So he's really helping to support the cidery business uh, as it moves forward. And the cider pump just showed up on the farm. So that's kind of our first real piece of equipment. But I just want to stress to people starting out, you just don't have to buy it all yourself. It's there. So Jessica, the artist, has really been building up her brand of Fat Blossom Girls. Um, Eckers Apple Farm and Hogsback Brew Farm are two separate entities to help balance insurance and risk that there is alcohol on the farm. And currently, Jess holds a retail beer license for her beer garden and a federal winery license, and she is awaiting the state winery license. And what is just, um, I mean, it's been five years in the making. So Jessica said, if you have questions about this, she said very respectfully, but please don't call her. <laughs> she, she just, um, she feels like she's not the expert on it. It's taken her five years to get this far. And, you know, when you're swimming in red tape, you need a life vest and those are going to be your people at the, she said the TTB, but also your local, um, just, just your local zoning and 
you'll you'll have to make those relationships and and forge those bonds because you're going to need those people. Our music venue started out uh, very modestly and just on pallets, but clogging groups really liked it. And it took several years, but as she could afford, then Jessica was able to um, build this stage. And it it's really it's really great. Kids love it too when there's no band on it. They they enjoy it thoroughly. The Honeycrisp Hoot Nanny, uh, the first Hoot Nanny was in 2009, and my dad got to be at the first one. He said, Jess, why don't you go up to George's bar and get a quarter barrel? And at the end of the first Hoot Nanny, we still had half of that quarter barrel left over. And as I mentioned in the last one, they sold 60 kegs. So in 10 years, it really blossomed. It used to be a party to celebrate the end of the Honeycrisp harvest. And now uh, we might have to have another party to celebrate that the Hoot Nanny is over. It has really ballooned. So there's the 2012 Hoot Nanny. Um, and then the 2015 Hoot Nanny, we really hit on some good weather. So it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And it was really great to look through, as I made this presentation, all of the really great times that we have had. Um, now I look back and say, boy, I really enjoyed that 2012 Hoot Nanny when it was just a few of us jamming at the end of the night. And now it's um, just sheer exhaustion. <laughs> And I think this was either 2018 or 2019. Of course, we didn't have a Hoot Nanny in 2020. Um, so it's just another reminder that you have to diversify. Things were going very well and definitely could not have one this year. And I don't know if we'll do one next year. Uh, in 2019, after 10 years of having a free event, we do charge $10 of admission. We capped it at 4,000 tickets sold. And I think she sold about 3,000. So that is a huge event. Um, we got a little bit of pushback because it couldn't be free anymore. But when you have 3,000 people on your lawn, you have to pay a little bit just to protect your property. And, you know, 30, renting 30 porta potties is not cheap. So we have a farmhouse on site now that is a farm stay, just an Airbnb. And what's great about it is my great grandpa built the house for his, uh, for my great uncle, you know, at least 60 years ago, and they couldn't keep the house. So for my entire childhood, <laughs> another family lived basically in our front yard. And even after they sold it to the bank, and after the first owner, you know, we just didn't have the funding to buy it back yet. Frank, his family, um, when he passed away, they let us have first offer on it. So it really you know, if you have a property or the neighboring farm that you really, really want or need in your operation, just stay patient, wait for it till it's the right price. It might come around and you can snap that back up. It was rented every weekend from March until November. So people were really looking for a place to go get out of the city. We have done the Airbnb where we do three days in between each guest. So we just block that out when a new guest arrives so that you know, you have time to wait 24 hours, get in and clean it. Um, it's been it's been really nice for us. All of our guests have been largely very respectful to the property. We live there and they know that. So I think that helps with parties. You know, you, you definitely don't want someone to come and throw a kegger in your rental unit. And we say that the property has been completely just. She has redone every room um, very simply, but beautifully. Hey, Sarah, before you, yeah. <laughs> we'll just pause on this slide. Um, uh, for the Hoot Nanny, there's a question in the chat um, about who does the event planning for that. And I'm wondering if one of the reasons you're not doing it next year is because of the twins. So Jessica is definitely the event planner for it. So she has relationships with um, a local manager, a lo local music manager to get the bands in. We were very lucky that Them Cooley Boys is a great bluegrass band and they, one of them is from our hometown. So we were able to get an act that's probably bigger than we could afford for the last, for the life of the Hootenanny. Um, and who knows how long we can get them. 
um, they just really do it out of the kindness of their heart. But as they get higher and higher up management, you know, sneaking in the hometown act might not be possible. So Jessica does all that from booking the tents, porta potties. We don't, she just started charging the food trucks, but she gets about five food trucks in for the Hoot Nanny. Um, and the only reason she went to charging the food trucks a little bit is that a few of the food trucks just wouldn't um, give out food to the bands and the employees, our, our staff that works that day. So she just, everybody pays the same. It's a few hundred dollars just to make it fair for everybody. And not, um, if if it's safe to do Hoot Nanny next year, she'll be back in there. Um, we could not guarantee social distancing with thousands of people on the farm. So we skipped it this year. And Jessica is now very pregnant with twins. So it was great to not have that event this year because it's a lot on her plate for several months going into it. So. Great. This is our, then, as you're going yeah. into this slide, one question yeah. that you could answer while you're talking about social media is where your customers come from, perhaps too. That is, so our customer base, we're in Little Trempolo, Wisconsin, but that is about 45 minutes from La Crosse, so that's 100,000 people, and about 10 minutes from Winona, and that's 30,000 people. Both of those places are college towns, so orchards are very Instagrammable, and so yeah, the they will the college kids just come out in droves to take their pictures. And you can gently, you know, you can't really say anything like, you know, to take your picture here, you you probably should buy something. But we hold our tongues quite a bit on that. Um, neighboring orchards do charge admission. We don't yet um, just honestly, yeah, they will come out and take their picture, get back in the car and leave. So <laughs> but uh, a lot of families, young families where the adults are, you know, they, they may even go to a neighboring orchard first and then come to us to have a beer, get one of our baked goods and just relax in a much more, it's pretty, it's pretty chill. So our, our social media strategy, I thought was very cute. Uh, Jessica mentioned to me her whole strategy this year is a picture, the event info and one joke and she's out. Uh, she doesn't like to take a lot of time on it. We're not as actively involved in social media as we could be. And we definitely don't try to barrage people's accounts. So one post a week is really our maximum. Um, Simon is always a good sport about dressing up in an apron and holding a pie for us. Uh, and I just can't, you know, Jessica did not tell us she was going to make that face. That was our Christmas card. Thank you for your business this year. And there's Jess. So. I just love her that I think she's just a beautiful person, but she is not afraid to look terrible in a photo, in a photo. So these are some things that did not work for us. Uh, morel mushrooms. We did it for probably 40 to 50 years. My grandma brokered them. Um, we buy from local pictures or local pickers and then uh, distribute further on down the line. And this woman, I know her face is almost cut off, but this is why we are not doing mushrooms anymore. Someone is always angry. So we're sorting through her mushrooms. Um, we have to ship them to Chicago to a restaurant and they need to be in perfect condition when they get there. And you can see the tops are blown out that they have frozen. They just, someone is always mad. And mom finally put a hard no and said, no, I am not doing it anymore. So we are beyond the morel mushrooms. There are people who are successful at it. Uh, we're out on that game. And then mini donuts did not work for us. So orchards in our area do $100,000 plus on donuts. If you're going to make a dozen donuts, they better not be miniature and only get $3 for that dozen. So I would like to do donuts in the future. My sister said, do not bring it up anymore until I'm willing to staff it because it's not, it's not fun in the donut trailer. I think if you're gonna do donuts, a massive hood is important. So, so this is a, the neighboring orchard that I just wanted to say, you know, this is how we do it. It works for us. This is how they do it. So we're very lucky. Farmer Tom has had this quote for a long time. It's not a race to the bottom. So they're 10 times our size. And if they would have decided to set the price of Honeycrisp at a dollar a pound, they could have, and it would have undercut all of us. And he just upholds this theory. You know, 
it's not a race to the bottom. There is enough of this pie to go around, make a bigger pie. So he also has this line, it's another beautiful day in paradise. So while I was making this talk, I called farmer Tom and asked if I could include him. And he said, absolutely, there's more than one way to do this. So I consider them our friends and mentors and they are the largest apple growers in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And here's how they do it. We have one real one location. They have three retail locations. We have 40 acres and they are 400 acres plus. They have a corn maze and animals and a giant bounce pad and a corn pit and these apple cannons, which I would like one, but they, we do not do these things. The only thing that we really have in common is you can pick your own apples. And we will see at the end of the day, you know, we're open till six, about four to five o'clock, you'll start seeing people with a Ferguson wristband come in and they're buying a four pack of caramel apples and a pie, grabbing a couple beers and listening to the music at the, at the beer garden. That is perfect. You know, we, we try to cater a little bit more to adults, just kind of says jokingly that kids don't have any money. <laughs> but, um, so to have them nearby, catering to the kids and to us catering to the adults. It, it's great. It's a steady stream at about four o'clock at our place because they've, they've gone and done the other orchards and now they're ready to relax. The future, double vision, I said, because the twins are coming. Um, Jessica would have liked to be here today, but she is moving pretty slow at this point. She's about eight and a half months in. Um, so in the future, high density blocks, uh, this block in the front here is 5,000 trees on five acres. The rest of the orchard is 7,000 trees, 30 acres. So we really packed them in here, but it's the same thing. Just grow apples, just don't grow as much tree anymore. Uh, a second farm stay, they're working on finishing off an area uh, upstairs um, to have, have a second one. It's been successful for us. The twins, I am really excited. I think there's going to be some more changes on the farm. Um, I know that there's so much of a, a push for sustainability on farms environmentally, and I think that that is very important. I also like to always throw in there the sustainability for the humans that are on the farm. So um, just, just making some changes, investing in some employees like like our new employee that came, you know, when we first started saying, you know, we're only 30 acres. We don't know if we can employ you year round, but now it kind of seems like, how can we not employ someone outside of the farm year round? Like to, to take care of twins and expand families and just enjoy life. I think we're going to need an employee that can take some of this, the pressure off. So this was from the first ski summit of Hogsback, um, bluff on the farm last week. So it's kind of a, it's a, uh, my most current picture. And fabrication now. So Simon is getting back into the fabrication side. I'm calling this Simon's second baby. And if um, people Google Wisconsin hemp stripper, you can find Simon's new uh, hemp stripping machine. I have seen it in action. It seems very effective. I know both, I, all Mom, Jessica, and I definitely took a deep breath when he went back into the fabricating business. There is still a machinery loan uh, that we're paying on from Dad's endeavors into the machinery business. It's challenging. Of course, they're great products and they work very well. Um, Dad got burned so many times where an, or an orchard would buy a packing line, he would install it, they would go bankrupt and pay 10 cents on the dollar. So we want to really go cautiously. This is Simon's own endeavor because we just can't afford to take on the risk on the farm. But if you are growing hemp, please check out a video or two. And one of my favorite quotes from my dad is, my worst decision is better than someone else's best advice. So uh, I will take any of your questions and answer them as fully as I possibly can and just know to trust yourself. Uh, you, you, you are your own best advice giver. Awesome. Well, I will uh, give a minute for some more questions to roll into the chat. But one that one that I want to ask you is, I mean, it seems like you and your and the rest of your family have um, 
very a very trusting relationship and probably pretty open communication day to day. Do you have formal meetings and how does the formal decision making work? We could definitely improve on our communication and formal meetings. I know that Ferguson's definitely do. They even do employee reviews on their own family. Uh, Tom, Farmer Tom's background is in automation engineering at 3M. So he was very in touch with the corporate world. We should improve on that. We do not have formal, formal meetings. We basically, you know, start teaming up. So I'll go to Simon and say, I've got something that I need to get more people on my side <laughs> and vice versa. So Simon kind of is the, the go between for, for everyone on getting the family one way or the other. Um, another kind of scary part to me, something that we need to definitely go into is we were very lucky that we had a lawyer that had our real estate set up in a trust so that when my dad passed, we could just keep going. We are still an LLC with one sole proprietor being my mom. So the, we're really at a point where we have to start transitioning or we're just going to be in into in too deep. Um, and here's a question from the chat. Uh, and I know that you live in town. Um, someone lives on the farm. Um, is there any, at any point, like how does it affect your, um, you know, the, the stress on different people to be living on the farm versus not versus living on the farm? And are you planning to make any changes to that at any point? So I am lucky that they still let me keep a room at the farm. And prior to COVID, I really was staying about half time there and half time at our city house. So this is new for us that I'm mostly living 10 miles away. I, I think it is something that we'll have to keep an eye on that I'm there enough pulling my own weight and things like that. You know, a strange car drove in the farm a couple nights ago at three in the morning. And that is stressful for my mom and Jess and Simon, who still live on the farm. And I think just going forward, we're really going to have to work on our communication and, and make sure make sure we're being attuned to that. So. Great. And um, I know at the at the outset, you said. 25% uh, of your revenue is wholesale, 75% retail. Among that 75%, um, do you have any idea of what the breakdown is between, uh, you know, the the caramel apples or like the big events? Uh, no, I we definitely need to be more attuned to our numbers. I see at the International Tree Fruit Association meeting coming up, they they are talking about knowing your important numbers, but we could definitely do much better on that, especially knowing, you know, we know how much income is generated by making those caramel apples, but as, you know, taking out all the labor that goes into making them and making the caramel and picking the apples, we don't, we don't really have that. Um, and as I was making these slides, I did think too, you know, I wonder exactly how much labor goes into that uh, income that we're making on retail as well. So, um, Tom Ferguson says retail is a great way to bleed money. You can put a lot of money into it. I just know at the very end of the day, we shipped we shipped five semi loads to the wholesale packing house in Elgin, and um, we kept about one semi load of fruit for ourselves, one semi load of Honeycrisp. So I just straight up did the math on. 25% and, and that's the return you get. The thing also with the packing house is they don't pay you right away. So you have to have enough operating um, capital to be able to make it through the whole season and then get paid in January. So we'll always uh, keep some of each for sure. And there's a question about uh, when you are planting new trees, what varieties are you choosing and why? Uh, are you going for the Ludacrisp? Ah. <laughs> So um, we basically Honeycrisp is still the only variety that makes any money. So I just looked through a nursery catalog the other day and was like, oh, these are beautiful hundreds of different varieties, but I guess I'm still going to plant red strains of Honeycrisp, early Honeycrisp. And our uh, local packing house has one club variety, the pizzazz. 
Uh, and so we'll put those in because I know I can sell them to them at the very least. And as as we go forward, the Ludacrisp is a variety from a Midwest Apple Improvement Association. So in the Apple world, now there's all these club varieties. Some you can plant, some you can't. And so the MAIA is an open club that you just pay a fee and you can get in on their varieties. So we will be planting some Ludacrisp, uh, maybe a few hundred trees, but I would not invest heavily in any variety that you cannot sell all the apples yourself. Probably sell them to those college kids that don't buy anything. It's, it's, <laughs> it's true. And I would plant Ludacris, but basically because it has a hilarious name. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Here's a big question. Um, what advice do you have to current, to, to new farmers looking to add apples into their current operation or starting their own apple operation? I would, number one, you got, unfortunately, even if you like another variety better, Honeycrisp is the one that makes money. So I would put in Honeycrisp. I, you know, with our uh, equation there, 25% generates 75% of our income. Don't, I don't think you have to plant more than you can sell. Like a hundred trees is going to get you probably a hundred bushel, um, a bushel per tree. We're, we're 35 acres and I bet I sell, you know, five of that out my front door. So you don't have to go huge and then pick a spot that isn't low because they're, they're going to die in the low spots. It, as far as on trellis or not, trellis is definitely the way to go for us. You can really pack them in there, get production sooner. But as far as can they, you know, can they make it through a hundred mile winds? No. So I don't know. All right. <laughs> um, so you're putting in a cidery. Are you planning to put any cider specific apple varieties to grow on your farm or what what apples are you planning for your cider? So our cider apples, we have um, we have 200 or so uh, cider specific apple trees. I think in Michigan, they're saying, you know, if you can get 5% of your final mix, your final blend to be those cider specific apples, that's good. And then they're just filling in the other 95% with dessert apples. We grow a lot of Honeycrisp. So our cider is mostly Honeycrisp. And then we had one bin of cider fruit this year. And those trees, if you're going to put in cider trees, I would try to find the ones that are most disease resistant. I don't, to me, I don't even care if they bear well, just that they don't die and spread disease to the rest of your orchard is my goal. The, I, that sounds familiar. <laughs> heard that, heard that uh, nod before. Fire blight um, is really, you know, fire blight is a disease in apples that you want to be averse to. You do not want to play with fire. And one more question, I think, before we'll need to wrap it up. Um, I know that you've tried some other crops. Have you thought about diversifying into any other perennial crops at this point or sticking to apples? So we have blueberries. And now that we have this young man, Taylor, who is going to help with the management side, we are going to win on the blueberries and we are going to cut down our peaches and cherry trees this year. They are in prime apple real estate and I have proved to myself over the last decade, they are not going to make us any money. They do not want to live in Wisconsin. I'll plant them again, but the ones we have currently have got to go. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, on, in the conference and Sarah, especially thank you to you for preparing this presentation and taking the time to run some practice sessions with me <laughs> prior to today. Um, yeah, and, and thanks to your sister too for uh, giving you information even though she uh, couldn't participate. <laughs>